Gabriella Roman. And I'm Caitlin Entry. We are both students at Cornell University and are interested in deer. Today we're here to talk to you about deer biology and how too many deer can be a problem for us, the forests, and deer themselves. Deer are a wildlife success story. They are very abundant across North America today, but that wasn't always the case. Before Europeans settled North America, there were an estimated 50 million white tail and mule deer. But unregulated hunting and mass slaughter of deer for their hides, like this one here, brought deer numbers down to just 350,000 by 1908. But deer made a comeback. To avoid the approaching extinction of deer, deer and their habitats were protected and hunting was regulated. And the results were dramatic. Today, there are an estimated 30 million deer in the United States. Deer are now becoming very problematic in some areas because there are just so many of them. Let's talk about why this is. White-tailed deer are a very successful species because they are very adaptable. They can live in many different climates, from the temperate forests of New England, to the Sonoran Desert, to the tropical regions, and now they are increasingly common in suburban areas too. Many deer in one environment create the potential for numerous deer vehicle collisions. There is an estimated 1.5 million deer vehicle related accidents a year that occur in the United States. This is very dangerous in regards to the safety of both humans and deer. Areas with very high deer populations often have high numbers of deer with broken limbs due to car collisions, like this doe. But too many deer can also cause problems for their own natural habitats. Deer can be picky eaters. They prefer certain foods and will eat them first. The eating habits of deer can create serious problems for forests. Because deer eat food found in both forests and in fields, deer prefer edge habitats, such as where a forest meets a field. A forest can support fewer deer than a suburban area can. This is mainly because the suburbs have better food and more edge habitats. Forests are made of layers. Young trees sprout from the forest floor, grow up through the understory, and become big, tall adult trees. When trees are very young and only a few feet tall, they are susceptible to deer browse because deer can reach them. Deer like to eat the leaves and buds of several species of trees, such as red maples. If there are too many deer walking through a forest, they can eat the young red maple trees until the trees die. This decreases not only the number of trees in a forest, but also the diversity of tree species in a forest. Less species diversity in a forest means less habitat, and habitat loss is the number one cause for extinction. Just like humans, deer need food, water, and shelter to survive. But when you have so many deer in one area, they will all go for the same resources, and these resources will eventually run out. Good food, good health, and few predators makes deer very prolific, to the point where there are sometimes too many of them. Let's figure out how fast a deer population can grow. A doe's first litter is usually one fawn, and she can give birth as early as one and a half years of age. If there's enough food, she can give birth to twins every year for the rest of her life. And occasionally, she can have triplets too. A seven-year-old doe can produce more than 13 deer in her lifetime. Under good conditions, a deer's population can double in just two years. What do high deer populations mean for our forests? We said before that deer browse, which is when they eat leaves, buds, shoots, and other parts of woody plants. Too many deer eating in one area can harm or even kill trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. An indication of deer overpopulation is a browse line. This is when foliage always gets eaten back by deer. If you have lots of deer in your area, look around your neighborhood for a browse line. The eating habits of deer don't just harm woody plants, they can transform an entire forest. When there are too many deer eating in one area, they will eat all their favorite foods first until there are none left. More edge habitats are created by suburbs through the clearing of forests to make room for houses and roads. The clearing of wooded areas in order to build houses or roads breaks up a forest, which therefore creates more edges, which deer use to find food. Suburban areas provide lots of food sources for deer. Gardens, compost piles, and bird feeders are all tasty foods. Sometimes people hand feed deer. Also, there are fewer predators in suburban areas. Suburban areas provide safe havens for deer where they can thrive. And with a combination of their populations growing and human land development increasing, humans and deer are now living together. Deer are a common sight in some suburban areas more and more these days. They are seen napping on front lawns, crossing streets, and even approaching people. It's fantastic to see such beautiful wildlife up close and right near our homes. But when there are too many deer in a suburban environment, deer and humans collide, literally. 
Lyme disease is a nasty illness transmitted by ticks, which are bloodsuckers and feed on large animals such as deer and people. Lyme disease is spreading quickly through the northeastern United States because deer populations are spreading too. The best way to avoid Lyme disease is to avoid ticks, especially if you're in an area with lots of deer. This means not brushing up against tall grass and branches. And if you do, always check your body for ticks afterwards. This is me when I was five. This is exactly what not to do when approaching deer, despite how cute they may look. Aside from car collisions and possible disease caused by too many deer, there can also be increased property damage. Deer can eat your favorite garden flowers and trees. Sometimes deer can have problems with us, too. This young buck entered a mall by running through a window. He was set free, but he needed to get a lot of stitches. This buck got tangled up in a hammock in someone's backyard. And this doe got stuck in a tomato cage for three days. These deer were cut loose, but these situations are unfortunate and are bad for both people and deer. Sometimes deer can interact directly with humans. With deer in suburban areas becoming more used to the presence of people, they see people as less of a threat and will sometimes approach them. Hand feeding and petting deer can encourage them to approach people. It's great to see deer up close, but this creates a very risky situation for both you and the deer. Bucks can become fearless and aggressive during the rut and they may see you as their next challenger. It is best for deer to be afraid of us and for us to give deer and other wildlife lots of space and respect. This means not feeding them, approaching them, or touching them. If high populations of deer are left alone, forests and deer will both be in trouble. Deer management is meant to stabilize deer populations by either increasing or decreasing populations and improving their habitat. There are several ways to implement deer management. One way is to keep forests healthy to provide lots of habitat for deer. Hunting is a common way to control wildlife populations. Hunters are a stand-in for predators that are not present. Another way to stabilize deer populations is through sterilization. This causes deer to not be able to produce fawns anymore. This does not reduce the population of deer, but it can slow down the future growth. Sterilization is still being researched if it can be effective in some areas. I am part of a team that studies the sterilization of does at Cornell University. Deer populations are managed because people love to see deer. We want to live in harmony with healthy deer and their habitat. As our own territory spread through land development and forest fragmentation, we encroach on the territory of deer. Hopefully using the knowledge that you've gained from this video, you are now ready to make some differences in your neighborhood and community. Let's review some of the ways how we can effectively reduce our impact on white-tailed deer. If you see a deer, do not approach it. They are wild animals, despite how charming they may look. Don't feed deer. They will only start to like humans more and will no longer see us as predators. They will end up becoming the neighbors that never leave. Make sure you check for ticks after walking through tall grass or shrubs. Now that you are a deer biologist, you can go out and tell your friends and family what they can do to ensure the safety of deer and humans. Together, we can live in harmony with deer and respect their environment while protecting ours as well. Thank you so much for watching.